Hello everyone, welcome to the lecture on 3D computer vision and today we are going to talk about two view and multi view stereo. Hopefully by the end of today's lecture you'll be able to do stereo rectification and correspondence search along the scan lines to get the disparity map in the two view stereo and then we'll look at how to compute the depth values from this disparity map. Next we'll look at the scan line optimization algorithm and the semi global matching algorithm to enforce the global as consistency on the disparity map for the two view stereo. Finally, we'll look at the plane sweeping algorithm to perform multiple view stereo to obtain the dense 3D reconstruction. And of course, I didn't invent any of today's material. I took most of the content from these two lectures at UIUC and University of Toronto. You may follow these four links to obtain the original slides in these two lectures. I followed the CVPR 2007 paper on the plane sweeping stereo algorithm for multiple view reconstruction. And finally, if you are interested, I will strongly encourage you to look at this tutorial written by Yasu Furugawa in the year 2015. It's a very comprehensive tutorial on multiple view stereo. You can obtain this uh, tutorial for free online. Now suppose that we are given two images which we denote as the left image IL and the right image IR and we assume that these two images have a very large overlapping field of view and we know the relative transformation denoted by a rotation matrix and a translation vector between these two images. We further know the camera intrinsics values which we denote as K and K prime for these two uh, cameras that uh, which we use to obtain the left and the right images respectively. The objective of two view stereo is to recover the dense 3D point cloud from these two images as well as the information that is given to us earlier on. And we'll see in this lecture that an intermediate step to get the dense 3D point cloud would be to get what we call the disparity map. And this is also equivalent to the depth map. And it is interesting to note that stereo vision uh, plays a very important part in most of the biological life system in, in this world. And in particular, we can see that it's very important for the evolution of human being because uh, given a pair of uh, eye, we are able to sense the depth in the 3D environment. And this gives us the ability to navigate safely to prevent us from incurring any injuries within this environment. And this is a, a very big importance for our evolution. We can also see that stereo vision uh, it also used in recreational purposes where as early as 1833 the stereograms was invented by this guy over here Sir Charles uh, Wheatstone so basically what he did was to mount two camera two cameras that are very closely mounted together on a rigid rig and images of these two cameras were taken at the same time and we can see that because there is a shift in this camera location this means that the point on the left image might appear to be slightly shifted on the right image. For example, this here, it's on a location of uh, X and Y. And this particular pixel on the right image that corresponds to this left image would be occurring at a location of X prime and Y prime. And we know that uh, since they are both taken at the same time and uh, of the same scene, what it means here is that if we know the relative transformation between these two uh, camera, we'll be able to do triangulation to get the exact uh, 3D point of this. But in this particular uh, stereogram, what this guy uh, designed was a special eyeglass where when you look at this particular eyeglass, it will give you the sense of a, a depth based on the principle that any two corresponding pixels over here in this pair of stereo image is actually offset by a certain amount. 
And we can see that, uh, interestingly, this stereogram evolves to uh, what we know as the 3D movie in uh, today's entertainment industry. So if you have ever been to watch a 3D movie, you'll be given a pair of these glasses over here where you will put on this particular glass and look at the big screen. The big, big screen actually looks something like this, where uh, the disparity between the two pixels, that's what I have mentioned earlier on, because there is a slight shift between these two pixels on the left and right image. If I were to put the two images, or superimpose the two images together, I'll see that there is a slight disparity. For example, we can see here that uh, this point over here actually uh, it's from the left image and this which corresponds to this point over here that is in the uh, right image for example and by superimposing these two images together when we color the disparity between the left and right images with the two different colors over here uh, in this example over here is uh, red and blue we can see that by looking at a superposition of the left and right images through this particular glasses over here we will be able to obtain a sense of uh, depth more mathematically we actually uh, have learned the basic concepts of the two view stereo or how to obtain uh, depth from two views when we look at the mathematics of the epipolar geometry in the previous lecture so uh, essentially what this means is that given two images which we denote as i l and ir over here which is one is the left image and one is the right image as defined earlier on and in this particular case in the two view uh, geometry case, we, we are given the relative transformation, which is the rotation and translation. And essentially, what this means is that we will be able to get the essential matrix as well as the camera projection matrix P and P prime. And we know from the earlier lecture when we learned about uh, two view geometry, in particular the epipolar geometry, when, after we are given the two camera projection matrix, which is P and P prime, we'll be able to do the linear triangulation from pairs of image correspondences between these two views in order to get the 3D point in the 3D scene. And this is all up to a certain scale. In the case where we obtain the relative transformation from the computed essential matrix, but uh, in today's lecture, we'll see that uh, if we are given the rotation and translation, where the translation vector is with an absolute scale, that means we know the exact translation between the two camera centers. Using the same form of linear triangulation algorithm, we'll be able to do triangulation and obtain the 3D point, uh, which is in matrix scale. And now we can define the problem formally as suppose that we are given two cameras with a known baseline, uh, rotation and translation, uh, and they are rigidly fixed onto a rig. Uh, here's an example of the stereo camera. It's a Bumblebee uh, 2 Firewire camera, which can be purchased uh, off the shelf. So here in this particular casing over here, uh, we can see that uh, there are two cameras that are rigidly mounted onto a rig. This casing over here is a rigid rig where the two cameras are seated in this particular rig. So before this uh, rig is uh, sold to the consumer, the manufacturer actually did some calibration. Uh, we will see this actual step of the calibration, which we know, uh, know as the stereo rectification and calibration uh, later in this, this lecture. And uh, now suppose that uh, after the manufacturer has manufactured this particular stereo camera, we will know exactly what is the relative transformation, the rotation and translation between these two cameras mounted rigidly onto this uh, stereo rig, as well as the camera intrinsics of these two cameras, which we denote as K and K prime after the camera calibration uh, process. The problem of two view stereo is to find the depth map which gives us the dense 3D points of the scene. So what I meant by that map here is that, uh, well, the objective is that suppose that image one is taken by the left uh, camera over here and image two is taken by the right camera uh, over here. What we are interested in is that given these two images and as well as relative transformation, the intrinsic values of the camera, we want to recover for every pixel on the reference view. So 
uh, we can choose either the left image as the reference view or the right image as the reference view it doesn't matter but in most cases uh, it's conveniently chosen left image as the reference image so suppose that we choose the left uh, image as our reference image the dense depth map simply refers to uh, for every pixel in this reference image we want to get the depth value of this particular uh, pixel for every one of the pixel in the reference image and this is an example of the depth map uh, that we see the brighter the pixel it means that uh, the closer the object is to the camera so here we can see that this brightest over here and we, uh, it, what it means is that the 3d object that corresponds to this particular pixel in the reference image which is the grass patch over here it's actually much closer to the camera as compared to for example a darker pixel that is shown in the depth map over here which corresponds to the 3d object in the scene uh, that projects to this particular pixel over here now in comparison with the two view geometry case that we have looked at uh, when we studied the epipolar geometry in that particular case what we are interested in is just to get the sparse set of correspondences and then once we compute the essential matrix the or the uh, fundamental matrix and recover the camera projection matrices p and p prime we are only interested in doing a triangulation of this sparse set of correspondences and in that case uh, it's easier because we will just stick to these uh, sparse sets of correspondences of the image correspondences that we use to compute the essential matrix and uh, as well as the camera projection matrix so uh, what this means is that uh, we'll just make use of all these sparse image correspondences and together with the camera projection matrices and we'll do a linear triangulation to give us the 3d point in the scene in, in the case of the two view stereo which is what uh, we are looking at right now as i have mentioned earlier on we want to obtain a dense depth map that means that for every pixel in the reference image we want to do a linear triangulation uh, on this particular pixel to get the 3d uh, points that corresponds to this particular pixel here and what it means here is that for every pixel in the reference image we would have to find the correspondence pixel in the right image and this is not trivial because a naive way of doing this will lead to a very computationally expensive uh, result so one naive way of uh, looking at this would be suppose that uh, in, in the reference image which is the left image as shown in this figure over here uh, we are interested to find the depth of just one pixel uh, in the reference view because we know the relative transformation the relative uh, rotation and translation for this particular uh, pair of images over here and what this means is that uh, we would be able to compute the fundamental matrix because not forgetting that we are also given the camera intrinsic value denoted by k and k prime over here uh, together with this we can recover the essential matrix as well as uh, applying this uh, camera intrinsic onto the essential matrix we'll be able to recover the fundamental matrix and from here we'll be able to compute the epipolar line which is denoted as l prime over here so l prime is given by f multiplied by x which is uh, the coordinates of this particular pixel on the reference image once we compute the epipolar line which is shown by this uh, blue line over here on the right image the next thing for uh, stereo matching would be to slide the window across this particular uh, epipolar line and we'll find the correspondence of this particular pixel over here x uh, with respect to the right image over here along the epipolar line and once we have picked the best match which means that based on the visual appearance we want to choose a pair of it where the two patches of uh, the left and right images that corresponds to x and the other one would be on the epipolar line on the right image based on the appearance they must be uh, the most similar and so once we have the closest image patch in terms of a visual appearance we'll do a triangulation based on the camera projection 
matrices that we have obtained from the camera intrinsics as well as the relative uh, transla translation and rotation between the two uh, images to get the depth value because when we do a triangulation linear triangulation of these two we'll be able to get the uh, 3D point, which we denote as X over here, and as well as the depth value, uh, which is Z, with respect to the reference uh, camera uh, coordinate frame. And uh, once we get this Z value here, this means that we have obtained the depth value for this particular uh, pixel over here. And in the simplest case, of course, is we know that the epipolar line, uh, it's the corresponding scan line. What this means is that if I have a point here, which we denote as X that we have defined earlier on, and we compute the, the epipolar line that corresponds to this particular X over here, this particular pixel on the reference view, the simplest case would be that the epipolar line, which we denote as L over here, it's a line with the epipolar line, which we denote as L on the reference view. So what this means is that uh, we can simply just uh, uh, ignore the computation of the epipolar line and uh, take this particular pixel here, the patch over here, and slide it over this particular scan line, which is of the same height. This means that it has the same Y value. Suppose that we denote the image coordinate as uh, X axis and Y axis over here. So this means that the Y value of the reference image is the same as the y value of the right image and what we can just conveniently take this particular patch over here and slide it along the same y value and check for the patch that is visually most similar to the patch from our reference view and uh, notice the difference over here in the general case where we know that this is not true where the uh, the epipolar line does not correspond uh, well in the two views uh, so suppose that in this particular case here where we have generally a uh, rotation and translation over here and we know that this particular point can project to any point on the epipolar line uh, on the right image over here so in this particular case we can't do this uh, we what it means is that uh, it would be more computationally expensive in order to uh, find the dense correspondences of every pixel in the reference view because this simply means that for every pixel on the reference view what we need to do would be to compute the epipolar line for every pixel and recall that in our lecture in uh, epipolar line or in the two view geometry that every particular pixel on the left image would be cast as a different uh, unique epipolar line on the second uh, image over here. In the general case, this means that for every pixel, we have to compute the epipolar line and start searching along this particular epipolar line, which means that this is going to be more computationally expensive compared to this case over here, where we know that the epipolar line corresponds to the scan line. And this simply means that the two epipolar lines on the reference view and the right image they align with each other according to the y-axis of the image and this brings us to two cases of the epipolar geometry in the first case where the two epipolar lines are uh, aligned from our knowledge uh, in the two view geometry that we have learned in the previous lecture we know that this can happen when uh, there is a pure translation uh, between the two cameras. That means that the relative transformation of these two cameras are given by a rotation equals to identity. What this means is that the two cameras would have their principal axis parallel to each other. So these two parallel ax uh, principal axis of the two cameras, the left and the right uh, images, they must be parallel to each other in order for the rotation matrix to be identity. And in order for the epipolar lines of the left and right image to be aligned with each other. This means that, as we have defined earlier on, that uh, uh, we assign a axis to the image. Let's say we call the columns of the image X axis and the rows of the image uh, Y axis. What this means is that uh, in order for the two points, the corresponding point or the two epipolar lines to be aligned 
uh, with each other. The height in the y direction of the two epipolar lines, they must be uh, equal. So what this means is that the relative translation in the y direction, which we can see from this axis over here, would be zero because the two epipolar lines are aligned with each other over here. And there's only a difference between the relative translation in the x-axis. What this means here is that suppose that the x-coordinate over here in the left image, which we denote as x, and the x-axis coordinates over here, which we denote as x prime, the relative translation between these two, this means that x minus x prime would be equals to t. This is the relative translation in the x-axis uh, given by these two uh, coordinates over here. And of course, since the two image planes are aligned with each other, the relative translation in the z-axis would also be zero. And this would be the uh, efficient case that we have seen earlier on, because what this simply means is that for every pixel in the reference view, in the left image, we just simply need to slide it along the same scan line uh, in the right image to search for the image correspondences in the right image. And in the general case, which we will also look at uh, later, uh, that uh, we know that uh, the relative transformation could be anything. It could be generally be denoted by a relative rotation, R, and a relative translation over here. So in this particular case over here, the a naive way of doing this would be for an image pixel in the reference view, which is the left image over here, we need to com first compute the fundamental matrix uh, from the essential matrix as well as the camera intrinsic value of the two images. Then we need to compute the epipolar line corresponding to the one of the pixel in the left image, which we denote as L prime over here. This is given by F multiplied by X. And the image correspondence that correspond to this particular pixel X over here on the right image, we have to search for it by sliding a window according, uh, along the epipolar line and search for the patch where it has the closest visual appearance to, to this particular patch in the reference view. And this is computationally expensive. We'll see that uh, we can actually uh, transform this particular setting into this setting by doing what we call the stereo rectification. So in the simplest case, uh, the, as I mentioned earlier on, that the, the epipolar lines of the two views, they align with each other, or they we will simply say that they align uh, at the same scan line. And in these cases, the camera center are of the same height. This means that uh, what I meant uh, early, earlier on, it would be that this is uh, sign x and y axis they are of the same height where they are at the same row of the the image for example given a point over here which you denote as x the corresponding point x prime over here it would be anywhere along this particular row uh, at the same row of the uh, reference uh, image and they would also have a, a same focal length this means that the z value of this uh, relative translation would be zero. As a result, uh, we, we have seen earlier on that uh, the epipolar line will fall along the same horizontal scan line. So when these two epipolar lines uh, coincide or sits at the same row of the, uh, with respect to the reference frame, uh, we say that they fall in along the horizontal scan line of the image. We can see uh, this from the mathematics of the epipolar geometry that we have learned in the earlier lecture. Now, uh, we know that the epipolar constraint is given by this equation over here. Uh, this is the equation that we have seen in our lecture on uh, two-view geometry, where x prime transpose multiplied by the essential matrix uh, and x equals to zero. So we know that also from the earlier lecture that the essential matrix can be decomposed into the cross product of the translation vector and the rotation matrix. Hence, we can replace the essential matrix in this epipolar constraint over here with the translation and rotation. And since 
we know in this particular special case over here where the epipolar lines of the two images are aligned as well as the principal axis of the two images are parallel to each other. So this means that the relative rotation matrix between the two views, which is uh, the relative rotation and translation, uh, is between the two views is given by identity and T00. So T, as I have mentioned earlier on, would be the difference between X and X prime over here in the in the X coordinate axis. So X minus X prime would be giving us T over here. And uh, we can plug this two value, R and T, back into the essential matrix that we have defined earlier on to get this particular uh, three by three essential matrix over here. So we can see that it has a special structure where only two entries in this particular three by three matrix have a non-zero value. And uh, by plug this three by three matrix back into the epipolar constraint that we have seen earlier on, uh, we can define this particular uh, constraint over here, which evaluates to T multiplied by V prime uh, equals to T multiplied by V over here. T, because it's a scalar value, it can be cancelled away. So what this means is that V prime and V, uh, they are equal. And this simply means that because V here represents the Y axis, of the image. So what this simply means is that uh, by simply working out the epipolar constraint, we can show that uh, when the relative translation and rotation follows this uh, relation over here, the Y coordinates of the two images are simply aligned. And hence, the epipolar line of the two images are also aligned along the same horizontal scan line. Because we know that the two epipolar lines are aligned with each other. So what this means is that given a image pixel from the reference view, it actually projects or it actually transfer to an epipolar line on the second view, L prime, which is aligned at the same row of the reference image point in the left image over here. And this means that if we were to back project a light ray from this particular reference point, in the left image, we can see that the 3D point can lie anywhere on this particular image. And uh, hence, if we were to project this line, this light ray that is back projected on from the left image onto the right image, we can see that it's going to project onto the epipolar line, where this epipolar line is aligned with the height of this particular uh, reference image point over here. And similarly, if we were to uh, take a back projection of the corresponding point in the right view and project the light ray over here onto this uh, reference view, we will get the epipolar line, which we denote by L over here. And we will see that the two epipolar lines actually uh, align with each other on the scan line. This is simply because the relative transformation between the two views is given by R equals to identity, as well as uh, T is equals to uh, T zero and zero. Another observation, which we will see the mathematical proof later, is that uh, we, we know that, as I've mentioned earlier on, that uh, we can search for the image correspondence, the match of the image correspondence of X on the scan line uh, in this particular special case over here. On the right image plane, what this means is that we are going to slide a window along this epipolar line on the right image plane and search for the patch which has the highest similarity uh, at this particular location that corresponds to the image point in the left yeah, image over here. And one interesting observation is that we do not need to search along the whole scan line because if we know that this particular point here is the actual correspondence to this particular uh, image point over here, we, we will see that x minus x prime, which is the x coordinate. So suppose that we denote this as x-axis and y-axis, as I mentioned earlier on, and this x-coordinate is given by x and x-prime. So we can see that we do not need to search through the whole scan line because 
x minus x should always be more than zero. It cannot be the case where uh, this is less than zero or this uh, it's a, a negative value because we'll see later on uh, in our derivation of the how to obtain the the depth value from the disparity. So the difference between x and x prime over here is what we call the disparity uh, value, which we will need to first obtain from the, the comparison of the image patches, or in another words, the search for the image correspondences for the dense image correspondences for, of every pixel in the reference view to the right image plane. So uh, this means that uh, for every pixel over here, if we are able to find the correspondence we'll be in, in the right image, we'll be able to compute this value and record it down in this particular data structure, which we call the disparity map. So essentially, every value in this disparity map contains x minus x prime. And this value is obtained from the sliding a patch over here in the left image uh, across the scan line or the epipolar line on the right image. And then once we get the patch with the highest visual similarity with the patch in the reference view, we'll simply compute x minus x prime and store it in a table of the disparity map. And we'll see that this particular location over here, we did not search through the whole epipolar line because we know that this disparity value cannot be less than zero. Uh, otherwise, what this means is that if it is less than zero, then we might end up with a case where we have negative depth, negative z value. And this negative z value simply means that any uh, image correspondences uh, in this region over here would mean that the triangulation would end up to have a point behind the camera. And this is uh, not we, what we want because we know that we are always looking in front of the uh, camera. And uh, in the case of the two images are non parallel what this means is that if we are given uh, two images or two camera settings that are fixed rigidly onto a, a rig, and we know after calibration that this the relative transformation uh, between these two is in general rotation and translation where rotation need not be equals to identity and translation need not be equals to t00 uh, in this particular case what we can do here is that we can do a, a process which we call stereo ratification stereo ratification to mathematically align these two images into the parallel form where every epipolar line uh, falls on the same horizontal line uh, or the horizontal scan line. And in order to do this, uh, we will have to go through a two-step process. The first step would, of course, be the stereo calibration. So we'll first treat the two images from the two different cameras mounted onto a, a rigid rig uh, as two separate cameras. And we'll uh, first take a checkerboard which is what we have learned in the earlier lecture on camera calibration. So we'll take a checkerboard and uh, move it around in front of these two cameras. Then what we can do is that we can perform the intrinsic calibration respectively on the individual left and right cameras. So by doing this particular calibration, we'll get uh, the camera intrinsics, which is K and K prime. So here, here notice that uh, it's unlikely to happen that uh, two cameras, even they, though they might be the same model from the same manufacturer, it's quite unlikely that uh, they will have the same camera intrinsic value. So we need to first obtain K and K prime from the camera calibration using the checkerboard. And of course, we also need to figure out the distortion parameters as we have uh, mentioned earlier on in the earlier lectures. These are the tangential and the radial distortion uh, parameters. Altogether, there are five parameters that we need to uh, obtain from here, uh, each from the respective left and right cameras. So we can do this using the uh, checkerboard calibration, the Zhang Zhen Yu's uh, method that we, have, uh, that we have discussed earlier on in our earlier lecture. Then the next thing that we have to do would be after we get the intrinsic parameters, we can undistort the image because uh, if the cameras, in most cases, these cameras would be made out of uh, 
real lens, well, which is uh, which has a to a certain extent a radial and tangential distortion. So we have seen in the earlier lecture that it will appear something like this, where it's not exactly squarish pixel, but it will appear to be radial in in the image pixel, and we can apply uh, the undistortion uh, the distortion parameters to undistort this image into uh, something that looks like this where now the pixel appears to be in regular uh, squarish uh, or rectangular uh, shapes and uh, once we have undistorted the image we can use the undistorted image pair uh, between the left and right camera to compute the essential matrix so this is easy this is simply by uh, computing a set of uh, sparse correspondences between the two uh, left and right images. And then from here, we get the correspondence. We'll run a ransack based uh, eight point algorithm. This is what we have seen earlier on in our lecture on two view geometry to compute the essential matrix. And once we have computed the essential matrix, note that in this case, we get the essential matrix because uh, instead of the fundamental matrix, this is because we already have the camera intrinsic value from our calibration uh, process in the first step. And another reason why it's better to get the in essential matrix instead of the fundamental matrix is that because uh, recall that in our earlier lectures that for fundamental matrix is subjected to projective ambiguity. Uh, this is because the intrinsic value are taken to be unknown in that kind of setting. But in the context of a stereo vision, we know the intrinsic values already from calibration. So uh, we can avoid the problem of the projective ambiguity completely by computing the essential matrix. And once we get this essential matrix, we know how to decompose it into the relative translation and rotation value. We saw in the earlier lecture that uh, we can decompose this into uh, four solutions where only one of the solution would have a point that appears to be in front of the camera. So we can use one additional point to check for this. And another thing is that uh, we saw earlier on from our uh, two view geometry lecture that uh, after decomposing the essential matrix into the relative translation and rotation, we know that the translation is only up to scale. But in this particular case over here, since the correspondences here uh, can be obtained from the checkerboard, and if we know the checkerboard size, this means that uh, if we know the size of a box in this particular checkerboard over here, so if we know the distance between these two uh, points, we can actually do a triangulation, uh, which is up to a certain scale, which is up to a scale. And then from the triangulation, we can do a similarity transform to uh, just one point pair over here would be sufficient to uh, recover the scale of the translation vector over here. So this means that the rotation and translation can be recovered uh, with full metric scale because since we know the calibration parameters of the checkerboard in, in this particular context over here. And once we have obtained the stereo calibration, this means that we know the intrinsics as well as the, so this is the intrinsics uh, value as well as the extrinsics value of the camera, which is the relative transformation between the two cameras. The next step would be to uh, make use of these parameters that we have obtained from stereo calibration to do what we call the stereo rectification. So this means that uh, if we have two general views where in general the epipolar lines are not aligned with each other, so they are they are not aligned in a, a regular horizontal scan line. We want to make use of this intrinsics as well as the extrinsics of both the cameras to uh, rectify them mathematically such that the two images have epipolar lines that are aligned in a regular horizontal scan line. Now here's a 
figure that illustrates the whole process. So given the calibration checkerboard, these are the raw images where we can see that it contains uh, some distortion from the radial and tangential distortion. And once we have done the stereo calibration, this means that we have obtained the intrinsic values uh, as well as the five uh, distortion parameters that we have seen earlier on. We can make use of these distortion parameters as well as the camera intrinsics to undistort the images, uh, which we have seen how to do this in the lecture uh, on camera calibration. So once we get the undistortion, we'll see that the, the square over here looks, uh, it looks like a regular square. And then from this undistorted image, we can actually uh, compute the essential matrix, the regular RANSAC 8-point algorithm that we have seen earlier on to get the extrinsic parameter, which is the rotation and translation. From all these parameters that we know, uh, we can do stereo rectification where now, uh, after re stereo rectification, all the epipolar lines of the two views, they are going to line up uh, in a regular horizontal scan line. And finally, we can crop these two uh, images. And uh, now, in this particular case here, we ha would have uh, two views or two images from stereo pair of uh, cameras uh, such that they are aligned, uh, the epipolar lines are aligned and hence in order to get the depth map from the reference view, say for example the left view over here, the left image over here, we'll be able to uh, simply take any pixel from here and search along the scan line uh, on the other uh, image. So, uh, as I've mentioned earlier on, stereo rectification, the goal is to uh, mathematically align the two cameras into the same viewing uh, plane. What I meant here by mathematically align is that uh, the actual camera setting will still be in this setting. This means that whatever pair of images that we take from the camera, uh, it will still give us a relative uh, transformation of uh, R and T uh, as before. It's physically uh, impossible to tune or to adjust the camera setting such that the relative transformation here becomes uh, identity and T equals to T00 as desired in the uh, rectified uh, case. So it's physically impossible to shift the camera or to adjust the camera such that it always gives this setting because it has to be so precise. But uh, what we meant by mathematically align uh, the two images is that if we are able to obtain uh, the relative transformation, the extrinsics of the two views, which we, we are, of course, we are able to do that from the calibration that we have uh, described earlier on, uh, we can make use of this information to define a, a transformation homography on the left and the right image such that we can transform these two uh, with a homography H and H prime respectively. So by taking every pixel here, or by taking uh, the, the from the but this particular image over here, suppose that I'm representing one pixel here as X over here. So we'll see that we can make use of this rotation and translation to define the homography over here, such that we can transform this left image over here, every pixel on this left image to a new pixel over here, such that, uh, which I call X tilde over here, uh, such that the new pixel, the new image over here is aligned with the new image over on the other side of the uh, right image uh, after we have applied the same process to the right image. So this means that for the right image, I'm defining a, a H prime homography from the rotation and translation, and then apply every point uh, on the right image, which I denote as X prime over here, to H prime to get X to the prime. So this is the new image, such that the image where X to the and X to the prime after rectification, they fall onto the same epipolar line or a regular set of scan lines. And this is how it looks like. Uh, now, uh, in, in this particular example over here, uh, these two images are taken from two 
camera settings where uh, the camera settings uh, are related by a relative transformation of R and T. So we can see that for any point here, it's going to give a epipolar line, uh, which is uh, this line over here. And we can see that in the this setting in the uh, in practice. This is the kind of setting that we will get where we will have a relative transformation, rotation and translation between these two camera views where the epipolar lines between these two views simply do not align in a horizontal setting. So the objective of stereo rectification would be to make use of this to define a homography uh, between the two views H and H prime over here such that after applying the homographies onto this uh, pair of images respectively, we'll end up with a pair of images where the scan line of corresponding views now becomes aligned to each other. And uh, as a result, uh, what we will get here is that we'll, get, uh, we'll be able to compute for every point on our reference view. We'll be able to compute the correspondences uh, or the correspondence in the right view uh, very easily by sliding a patch along the corresponding scan line instead of computing the epipolar line. And it has to be noted that uh, this, since we compute the homography over here, so what this means is that we are mathematically manipulating the image such that into a state where the epipolar lines of both images are aligned with uh, each other. And what uh, what this also means is you know, we are not physically shifting the camera such that uh, it ends up with an image that looks like this. And all the rectify images after rectification, it should satisfy the following two properties as we have uh, noted earlier on. That is, the epipolar lines should be parallel to each other along the horizontal axis. So this is the horizontal axis. What it means is that the epipolar line, the corresponding epipolar line, they should become horizontal uh, to each other. And the corresponding points should also have an identical vertical coordinate. This means that the two views where I have my image point on the reference view, the left image, the, it must sit on an epipolar line that is aligned with the epipolar line on the other view. And we'll make use of these two properties to find a projective transformation such that the epipoles in the two images are mapped to the infinite point because in this case over here we can see that uh, after we have rectified this particular epipolar line to become horizontal to each other or what this means is that for every point on my reference image i'm going to have a corresponding epipolar line on the right image such that the two epipolar lines sits on the same uh, align location. And this holds true for any points, for any epipolar lines. So all that, what this means is that all the epipolar lines after ratification would not intersect at a common point, or rather they would intersect at infinity. And this simply implies that the epipole of the left and right uh, images now uh, would have to map to infinity. And hence, we can define a homography H, which is a 3 by 3 uh, matrix over here, to map the original image into the rectified image where the epipolar lines of this particular image would be mapped to infinity. Similarly, we'll do the same. We'll find a homography such that we can map uh, the right image which is called H prime over here, such that we can map the uh, right image into a setting where the epipole will be mapped in, uh, to infinity, which we define uh, as 1, 0, 0 over here. So uh, the last value over here, note that the last value over here has to be 0 because this is going to be an infinite point. Uh, zero here means that in homogeneous coordinate, it means that it's going to be at infinity. And one zero over here simply means that uh, there's going to be a value for the x coordinates over here. At zero means that uh, for the y value, it means that the two epipoles are going to be aligned at the same uh, location.